Okay, let's pick up where we left off with personality last time. And let's start with just a little bit of deep background, which is the shortest imaginable course in cognitive psychology and cognitive science. If you don't learn anything else, if you learn this, you've got the whole picture, okay? Uh, Jerome Bruner's three great aphorisms. First, the purpose of perception is action. The whole point of having a mind is to allow you to get along in the world. Uh, the whole idea behind studying the mind is that somehow the mind uh, enables us to engage in various kinds of adaptive behaviors to meet the challenges set by our environment, to achieve the goals that we set for ourselves, um, and so on. So the purpose of perception is action. No point in perceiving the environment unless you're going to do something about what you perceive. Second, perception requires the perceiver to go beyond the information given in the stimulus. This is actually an insight that comes to us at least as long ago as the mid-19th century in Hermann von Helmholtz, but the general idea is that the stimulus is not sufficient to tell us what's going on in the world. The information provided by the stimulus is vague and fragmentary and ambiguous, and yet the perceiver has to supply something, has to supply knowledge, beliefs, expectations, something to fill in the gaps, to connect things up, and to form um, a uh, workable uh, mental representation of the world outside, so you can take the action that you need to take. And then finally, every act of perception entails an act of categorization. When we usually think about perception, we think about perception in terms of forming an internal mental representation of the physical features of a stimulus, what its shape is, uh, where it is in the environment, what it's doing, whether it's moving or stationary or whatever. But Bruner uh, embraced a more cognitive view of perception, which really uh, assumes that the act of perceiving is not complete until you've identified the object, until you know what it is. Um, and part of knowing what an object is is knowing how that object is similar to other things you know about and different from other things you know about. And when you start classifying something as similar to one thing and different from others, you've categorized the object. And once you've categorized the object, that's a you've got a tremendous amount of information about the object because you can impute that that object has a number of features that kind of sort of go with objects in that category. Even if you can't see them, you, you can kind of assume that they're there. So um, that's kind of what's, what, what's happening here. And it follows from this, though Bruner didn't say it himself, that Action will differ if perception differs. And since categorization is, is, is an intimate part of perception, action will differ if categorization differs. If you categorize an event or an object in one way, you're going to behave towards that object in, in one way. If you categorize that object in some other way, slot it into some other category, you're going to behave very differently um, toward it. This insight, though he would never have admitted it, uh, lies at the heart of the most idiosyncratic, um, the most thoroughgoingly cognitive of all the approaches to personality and individual, and individual differences, which is the personal construct theory of George Kelly. George Kelly's there, spent his entire career at Ohio State University, was enormously influential. Uh, even though he didn't publish much, he wrote one book and a couple of articles. You could get tenure back then for that. Um, it's a book that hardly anybody has read all the way through. Um, it's kind of like you know, Wittgenstein's Tractatus or something like that. Every philosopher owns it, hardly anybody's read it. Um, and it's in large part unreadable. Um, Kelly was, uh, was an iconoclastic figure. Uh, he didn't interact with his colleagues very much. Uh, uh, he had a very unique way of, uh, of viewing things. Uh, he used, uh, used words in very strange ways, uh, basically not easy to penetrate. But what I'm going to do for the next I don't know, 25 minutes is tell you what's in a 1,500-page book that's almost unreadable. Okay? Uh, because it's really an interesting cognitive approach to personality and begins with the insight that what's interesting about personality is that there are individual differences in behavior. That's how we observe. Uh, that that's how we know the per that, that personality occurs. We see somebody being friendly and another person being unfriendly. And we say, oh, this one's friendly and this one's unfriendly. Those are individual differences in personality. Where do they come from? Well. If you're Bruner, if you're a cognitive psychologist or a cognitive scientist, you think that individual differences in behavior have their origins in individual differences in cognition. People, different people behave differently because they perceive the environment differently. Different people respond differently to a stimulus because they categorize that stimulus uh, differently. And that's the essential insight that underlies Kelly's um, personal construct theory of personality. Kelly begins with a proposition which by now should be familiar to you. It's one that comes out of Piaget as well, though Kelly never cited Piaget. Um, uh, he didn't cite anybody except himself, um, which was the idea that people are naive scientists. That as we go around in the world, we're trying to figure out how the world works. We're trying to predict what's going to happen next, uh, given what we know, given what we're doing, or so on. And in the process of, of acquiring knowledge about the world, we do it kind of sort of the way scientists do it. We don't have all the tools and all the professional training that scientists are supposed to have, but we're still in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the scientific mode of inducing theories from experience, generating hypotheses based on our theories, testing those hypotheses, and revising our hypotheses and our theories based on the results of our little informal experiments. That's the idea behind the person as a naive scientist, and you'll remember that that comes to us from Lewin and Kelly uh, and others, as well as, uh, as well as from Piaget. Kelly argued that our hypotheses, the hypotheses that we generate and test as naive scientists, are based on what he called personal constructs. Kelly argued that all of us walk around in the world carrying around in our heads a set of constructs or categories or concepts that we use to guide our perception of the world and our action uh, in the world. Uh, and I'll talk more about where these, what these personal constructs are like uh, in a minute, that's the whole point of this lecture. But that uh, he also argued that there was the possibility of what he called constructive alternatism. Not just that different people carried in their heads different sets of personal constructs that guided their perception and behavior, but that people themselves could shift from one construct to another. And when an individual shifted his mental view, his mental filter, if you will, from one construct to another, uh, his perception of the world would change accordingly, and so would his or her behavior. So the idea is personal constructs are filters on our experience of the world. We have some flexibility in terms of the constructs that we use to filter our experience of the world, and which constructs we use are going to depend, are going to determine how we behave um, in um, uh, that world. The, the idiosyncrasy of Kelly's theory is, I think, nowhere better illustrated than by what he called the fundamental postulate of personal construct theory. A person's processes are psychologically channelized by the ways in which he anticipates events. This is a combination of words that is almost unique, I suppose, in English. Uh, he didn't want to talk about behavior. He didn't want to talk about thoughts. He wanted an umbrella term, so he chose the term processes. Psychologically channelized. That is, at the, level, at the psychological level of analysis, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about how neurons operate. He's not talking about how neurotransmitters work or genetic determinants of personality or anything else. He's talking about uh, uh, looking at behavior, thoughts, whatever, uh, at the psychological level of analysis. And then by the ways in which he anticipates events. That is, what you do, what you think is going to be determined by what you expect to happen. Okay? And these expectations, it turns out, 
are going to be um, are going to be generated by the constructs that you use to uh, to perceive the world. So what's missing from this? I mean, this is it. This is the whole theory. 1500 pages later, you come back and you say this is it. Uh, what's missing? There's no notion of personality traits. At this time, 1955, uh, personality psychology was divided into two largely uh, uh, two large camps. One, trait psychology, as exemplified by what we now call the Big Five theory of personality, that said that you could locate people as points in some multidimensional space, depending on how they measured up uh, in terms of various trait dispositions. Or psychoanalytic theory, which argued that personality really was determined by a set of primitive motives, uh, sexual and aggressive motives, and the defenses that were arrayed against them. There's no mention of this anywhere in Kelly. He never once uses the term personality trait. If I, if I remember correctly, he doesn't talk about motives, he doesn't talk about drives, he doesn't talk about sex, he doesn't talk about aggression, he doesn't talk about neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience, the big five. He doesn't talk about learning, which is the other big thing that was going on in psychology at the time. Skinner's uh, behaviorist uh, theories of learning, uh, contingencies of reinforcement, schedules of reinforcement, all of this is missing from Kelly's, uh, 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 from, from, from Kelly's theory. He's really starting from first principles and then trying to elaborate uh, uh, a, a, a consistent cognitive theory of personality. And if it doesn't connect up with anything else, Kelly would say, it's just too bad for them. I don't, I don't care. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the fundamental postulate. And then what Kelly does is to work out this fundamental postulate and its implications in a series of corollaries, a theoretical structure that is not unlike what we saw when I uh, introduced you to the, uh, the social learning theory of Julian Roeder. Uh, this is no accident. Roeder and Kelly were colleagues at Ohio State. They didn't talk to each other much, as far as I can determine, but, uh, but they, did have, uh, uh, they did share a building. Um, and they were developing kind of competing, uh, competing theories of personality, all using this formal structure of postulates and corollaries and all of this kind of stuff. But whereas Roeder developed a cognitive social learning theory that really kept very close to the uh, traditions of learning theory that were familiar to him in psychology, uh, Kelly threw it all out and said, we're going to start from scratch here. Uh, we're not going to base our theory on, uh, on anything else. Nobody really got what Kelly was up to at the time. And the reason for this is, again, check out the date, 1955. This is a heyday of Skinnerian functional behaviorism. Nobody was thinking about cognitive sci uh, uh, psychology. Uh, nobody was thinking about cognitive science. Nobody was thinking about cognition. All they were really thinking about was stimulus and response and behaviorist theories of, uh, of learning. Okay. The first corollary in Kelly's personal construct theory is what he calls the construction corollary. A person anticipates events by construing their replication. Again, this is weird language, right? It really doesn't have to write this way. Uh, but basically what he says is you anticipate events by categorizing them. And if once you've categorized an event, you kind of know what to expect. That's what he means by anticipating events by construing their replications. If you had another object in this category, here's what it would do. If you had another uh, event in this category, here's what its consequences uh, would be. So here we get the core term in Kelly's personal construct theory, which is the construct, which is his name for concept. I mean, he couldn't even bring himself to use a word like concept. Right? He had to use something strange. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, he starts making distinctions between various kinds of constructs. First, the distinction between core constructs and peripheral constructs. Core, core constructs are central. Um, to the way a, pers a person perceives and experiences the world. They apply to lots of different kinds of events. They apply to lots of different kinds of, um, of objects. Peripheral constructs are, as their name implies, not so important. You use them from time to time, but they don't play a major role in your, uh, in your experience of, uh, of the world. Um, then Kelly makes a distinction between verbal constructs and pre-verbal constructs. As you might suggest, verbal constructs are constructs you can verbalize. You can express in a word or two, uh, maybe, a short, uh, maybe a short phrase. But uh, remember, concept, uh, the constructs are concepts. They're all, most concepts are labeled by words, like bicycle or automobile or neurotic or extrovert or whatever. Um, and uh, so these con many constructs can be labeled verbally. Others are not easy to articulate. Um, this is as close as Kelly ever comes in his theory to the notion of an unconscious concept or an unconscious thought. And he doesn't really want to talk about consciousness or, uh, or, or unconscious mental life. But he argues that some constructs are represented verbally in terms of verbal labels. Others are not. These are easier to talk about than these precisely because these are pre-verbal. They're not easy to articulate in words. As I say, it's not exactly the same thing as, as something unconscious. You might be conscious of, your, of having this construct but not be able to kind of articulate it to somebody else. Um, but that's as close as, um, as it comes. Okay, the construction corollary. A person anticipates events by figuring out what construct applies to them. Or, more properly, a person anticipates events by applying some construct to them. And we're going to see a little bit later on that you can choose what construct you're going to apply to some particular event. The individuality corollary. Persons differ from each other in their constructions of events. Everybody carries around in his, in his or her head a different set of personal constructs. That's why they're called personal constructs. We don't all have the same ones. Even those of us who grow up in the same culture, uh, have the same religious faith, have gone to the same schools, have roughly the same socioeconomic status, even if you grow up in the same household with somebody else, you're not necessarily going to have the same set of personal constructs. Okay? But the constructs you have are yours. Okay? And they're going to determine how you anticipate events, how you perceive the world, and how you anticipate events is going to determine how you behave with respect um, to, uh, to those events. So, okay, that's the, uh, that's the individuality corollary. That's basically all he has to say about that. And again, he wants, just wants to make it clear that you don't have, you might have constructs because you're an American or because you're a Lutheran or because you're female or whatever, but even if you're, even all Lutheran American females are going to have their own sets of personal constructs. And that's the key to individual differences in personality, the key to human uniqueness. The organization corollary. Each person characteristically evolves for its, for its convenience and anticipating events, a construction system embracing or no relations between constructs. All he had to say was constructs are arranged hierarchically into superordinate concepts and, sub, and subordinate concepts. But no, Kelly couldn't possibly do that. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that, that's basically what he means. That within your personal construct system, there are some very broad, very abstract, very highly generalized constructs. And then embedded underneath them, arranged in a hierarchical fashion, just like, you know, usual kind of uh, uh, concept, are more narrowly defined, more narrowly focused uh, kinds of concepts. Yes? Uh, yeah, he did. He, just not in the corollary itself. Uh, if my, my memory, I actually have, I spent an entire summer reading this book. Um, uh, it's, yeah. 
No, no. This corollary is about hierarchy. It's about vertical arrangement, ordinal relations among concepts. Some concepts are bigger, other concepts are littler. Some concepts come first, other concepts come later. So no, he doesn't have a sense here in, of, of that kind of system. Okay. Uh, so you got some, you got the, uh, the superordinate concepts, which are very broad, and by virtue of being superordinate, have a lot of implications. Okay. They carry a lot of information. If you construe an event in terms of a higher order superordinate concept, that uh, that very abstract concept provides a lot of information about the uh, about the thing. If you've got a subordinate concept, it provides a much narrower range of concepts, so, uh, a much narrower range of, of information. Think about a standard hier conceptual hierarchy. If I tell you something's a vehicle, you can predict that you know it moves and it moves things, and you can use it for transporting stuff. And it's probably got wheels, so they don't always have wheels. If I tell you something's a Buick, it's got all those features, but then it's you know it's big, and your grandfather owned one, and stuff like that. Uh, so they're just kind of different kinds of information at different uh, levels of, um, of construction. The organization corollary. The dichotomy corollary. A person's construction system is composed of a finite number of dichotomous constructs. In the organization corollary, we're interested in the vertical relations between constructs, subordinate and superordinate. In the uh, dichotomy corollary, we're talking about uh, the horizontal relations among constructs. Uh, basically, Kelly is saying here that every construct has attached to it an opposite. Okay, so our constructs are really not categories so much as they are categories and, um, and, uh, and they're opposites. The pole of the dichotomous construct that we tend to use in perceiving the world is what he would call the emergent construct. Its opposite is what he would call a contrasting construct. Now, you might think that, oh, this is pretty simple. This is like warm, cold, good, bad, male, female. Yes, it could be like that. But Kelly was very clear that for the individual, for any particular individual, the emergent, the, the contrast between the emergent construct and the contrasting construct might not be what you might think it is. So you could imagine somebody who has a construct of male, and you might think, well, the, 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 uh, the contrast is female, but no, it might be good. Okay, so the world is divided into those that are male and those that are good, and uh, that's just kind of the way that person thinks. It's the way the individual organizes the construct. You can't get these dichotomies by looking them up in a dictionary. They're personal constructs. It's a personal organization of experience. Sometimes people have difficulty thinking about what the contrast is. Again, this is where Kelly starts talking about thinking about things that are pre-verbal or maybe kind of sort of unconscious. He would call those submerged contrasts. Okay, the submerged, you can't see them. Okay, you've got to work hard to kind of dig out exactly what the contrast is. But the important thing here is that if all you know is what the emergent construct is, you only know half the story. You've got to know what the contrast is as well. It makes a big difference if a person divides the world into male and female or good or bad, and another person divides the world into male and bad, right? or female and good, or female and bad, or whatever it is. That's a different organization, and that person is going to behave quite differently um, uh, in, uh, in the world. The choice corollary. Yes? Um, what, the, what he's really talking about is a finite number of constructs. Okay? So that the constructs themselves have come in a finite number. You don't have thousands of them. Okay? But the, con the finite number of constructs you have are themselves dichotomous. Okay, so a dichotomous construct can have only two poles. That's what dichotomous means. Okay? Um, and he's saying, well, people have probably more than one, but they don't have hundreds or thousands of these things. Um, it's a relatively reasonable number. He didn't know about it. This is 1955. But you might think of something like George Miller's magical number 7 plus or minus 2. You might say, yeah, most people have you know, somewhere between 5 and 9 constructs that kind of really rattle around in their heads and organize their view of the world. Could be 15 or 17, could be 25 or 27, but it's some relatively small number. Okay? And we'll see how you figure out what these constructs are in a couple of minutes. It's a very interesting procedure that Kelly invented. Okay, that's the dichotomy. Choice corollary. Okay? Person chooses for himself that alternative in a dichotomized construct through which he anticipates the greater possibility of extension and definition of the system. Okay? In other words, you've got these personal constructs. Let's keep it simple. Warm, cold, good, bad, smart, stupid. Okay? But what you do is you choose for yourself which pole of each of those contrasts really works for you. So somebody might go around, uh, uh, go around the world thinking, oh, most people are pretty good. So good is the construct of choice in, uh, in, in, out of the good-bad dichotomy. Another person who's a little bit more pessimistic, maybe a little bit more paranoid, might say most people are bad. So what the, what the bad filter is going to go up. Okay? The, the, the default assumption is going to be that most people are, uh, are not, very nice, um, not very nice people. Okay? Um, now, you choose for yourself that alternative in a dichotomized construct system that really works for you, that helps you to anticipate events, that is most useful in predicting what's going to happen next or what features some, some object is going to have. But it stands to reason that the more of these you have, the more possibilities you have for viewing the world. So Kelly starts talking about uh, 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 the individual differences, not just in the contents of somebody's personal construct system, but also individual differences in the complexity or the structure of the, person, of the person's con uh, personal construct system. You can imagine a person who goes around in the world who has a very monolithic personal construct system that consists of just one dichotomous construct, good, bad, or male, female, or warm, cold, or smart, stupid, or whatever it, uh, it might be. A person who has a personal construct system that is that monolithic really has only one or two ways of viewing the world. You can see the world as good, you can see objects and events as good, or you can see them as bad, but you can't see them as anything else, because that's all you got. The more personal constructs you have in your system, the more different ways you have of construing the replication, the more different ways you have of viewing, um, uh, of viewing the world. Or put another way, the more opportunities you have for constructive alternatism, the more opportunities you have to say, oh, I'm not going to apply this construct to the world today, or this particular object, or whatever. I'm going to choose this one um, instead. The more options you have cognitively, then the more flexible your behavior. But if all you do is see the world in kind of Manichaean terms, black, white, good, bad, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, male, female, or whatever, if that's all you got, then you're very limited, not just in your cognitive repertoire, but you're very limited in your behavioral repertoire as well. Why? Because it's your cognitive repertoire, it's your repertoire of personal constructs that gives you the opportunity uh, that, that directs your behavior uh, to, uh, to begin with. Choice corollary. Then there's the range um, the corollary. Uh, the construct is convenient for the anticipation of a finite range of events only. Okay. What Kelly's talking about here is that under ordinary circumstances, not